Hi everyone. So in the last video, I introduced the concept of the two types of mass, inertial versus gravitational, and I talked a bit about the experiments that Newton did um, to demonstrate that those two types of mass are really the same, or at least proportional to each other. So what I'm going to do this time is explore this idea a bit more and talk about the Erdvosh experiment, which is an experiment that was done around 1900, so much more recently than Newton's time. Um, and the result of this experiment was uh, a conclusion to an even higher degree of accuracy, that the inertial and gravitational mass are really the same as each other. So we're going to have a look at the setup of this experiment and work through some of the theory behind the experiment so that we can understand how to interpret the results. So the basic setup is shown on the diagram that I've sketched out here. Basically, you have a piece of string, maybe you want to be more formal and call it something like a torsion fiber, but basically some kind of piece of string. And from the end of the string, um, you hang a rigid rod, which is this horizontal line here. And at each end of the rod, you attach a mass. Now the masses can be different. In fact, they should be made of different materials and their masses don't have to be exactly the same. I've drawn them as different sizes here, um, but we are going to end up putting this system in equilibrium. And so, the bigger mass or the, the heavier mass is going to end up closer um, to the place where the string joins onto the rigid rod, right? And that will result in a balance of moments. So the aim is to set up this apparatus in such a way that it is initially in equilibrium. And so our first step is going to be to think about what the condition for equilibrium actually is. And of course, to do that, we need to think about the forces acting on the system. And so let's think about the obvious forces first. The most obvious forces are the weights of um, each of the masses at each end. So I'm going to draw those on. And remember, the point of this is that we have to distinguish between gravitational mass and inertial mass. So the weight of mass one, I'm going to write as m subscript g1 times gravitational field strength, where mg is gravitational mass, right? So gravitational mass of object one times field strength, and then the equivalent for object two, which is of course mg2 times field strength. So there must of course also be some upwards tension in the string to keep the whole thing from falling down. Um, but more importantly than that, this experiment was actually set up in such a way that it was sensitive to certain forces which are often negligible, which are the fictitious forces experienced by, well, every object um, that's co-rotating with the Earth, in particular, the centrifugal force. Now, to understand what direction the centrifugal force is pointing in, I think it's best to take a step back from our uh, lab apparatus and look at the Earth rotating as a whole, because that is the rotating frame that we're conducting the experiment in. And so I've got a diagram uh, down here of the Earth rotating about its axis with an angular uh, velocity of capital omega. And here is a not to scale version of our experiment hanging down vertically towards the center of the Earth. Now, um, just to annotate this a little bit more, uh, let's draw a line from the center of the Earth um, going straight up to the point where we're doing the experiment and draw a horizontal line as well. Uh, the angle between those we could call theta. That's the latitude at which we're conducting the experiment. And the centrifugal forces always just act directly away from the axis of rotation, right? So I could draw in a different color uh, two centrifugal forces acting on the two masses. Let's call them C1 and C2. And they're just acting straight out, like straight out away from the, the axis of rotation. Now, what about the magnitudes? Well, we can say the ith centrifugal force, where i can be one or two, just to combine them into one convenient expression. Um, I'm going to use the standard expression, which is mr omega squared. Uh, how can we apply that to this particular example? Well, the relevant mass is not the gravitational mass, it's the inertial mass, right? Because the centrifugal force is a fictitious force that arises due to the inertia of objects. So it's the inertial mass that matters. I'm going to say M capital I uh, and then lowercase i, where I'm, that really means inertial mass of object I, object one or two. Um, now, if the radius of the Earth is capital R, then we can put r omega squared here, but the radius of the circular motion is not really r, right? Because our object is not at the equator, it's doing a circle um, whose radius is actually given by r cos theta, and that just follows from trigonometry, right? It's from there to there, uh, which is r 
cos theta. So this is the magnitude of the centrifugal force acting on each object, which is proportional to the inertial mass. So if we add those onto our diagram, we could draw them, they should be pointing in the same direction, right? So let's say C1 is going something like that, C2 going something like that. Remember, this is a 3D diagram, so maybe we should introduce some Cartesian coordinate axes um, just so that we can specify, um, you know, we can, we can talk in more detail about components of forces, what direction they're acting in. If we put the origin of our coordinate system at this point where the string meets the rod, um, let's make a right-handed coordinate system where Z points up, Y points to the right, and X is coming out of the screen. Then C1 and C2 have, in general, a component in all three directions, right? So the C1 and C2 may be coming partially out of the screen, partially into the screen, although it looks like a 2D diagram, right? So I've just put that coordinate system there to emphasize the fact that C1 and C2, depending on the angle at which we've set up our apparatus may have components in all three directions. So now let's start making this a bit more quantitative. Um, we're going to take moments, remember we said we arrange it so that the system is in equilibrium. In particular, the most important thing to start with is that there's no net talk about the x-axis, right? And that basically just means that it's not the case that one of the masses just sort of hangs down and causes the whole system to rotate about the x-axis. Now, to take moments, we need to define some perpendicular distances. Let's say this bit on the left is L1, this bit is L2. Those are distances measured from the, uh, the center of our Cartesian coordinate system. So what's the equation that expresses the balance of moments? Well, we just want to say that the um, anti-clockwise moment caused by object 1 balances the clockwise moment caused by object 2. That anti-clockwise moment, um, we're going to start by multiplying by L1, and we need to times the perpendicular component of the resultant force on object 1. Now, of course, there's the weight acting downwards, that's m subscript g1 times g, but there is also an upwards component um, of the centrifugal force C1, which is acting in the opposite direction to the weight. So, um, given that we've said that the upwards component um, is the z component, we can write that as minus C1 z. Like we only care about the z component when we're taking moments about the x-axis. Um, and then for the same reasons, our right-hand side is going to be L2 multiplied by the weight of object 2 minus the z component of the centrifugal force acting on object 2. Basically because the x and y components of the centrifugal forces don't produce, they don't have a perpendicular distance to the x-axis and they don't tend to cause a rotation um, about the x-axis. So we can rearrange this. Let me write this as a length ratio L1 over L2. It's going to be m g2 times g minus c2z and then divided by the equivalent but for object 1. So m g1 times g minus c1z. Right. And so there's this certain ratio of these two lengths for a given set of gravitational masses, certain length ratio um, that must be satisfied um, if the system is to remain in equilibrium. The tension T doesn't appear anywhere in this equation because, again, T acts through the x-axis, so it doesn't have any perpendicular distance to the x-axis. Um, I'll also point out that there is not going to be any net talk about the y-axis. In other words, the system is not going to suddenly start spinning about the axis of the rod because all of the forces um, act through that axis. However, it would be worth considering whether there is any net talk um, about the z-axis, and this is actually the crucial um, part of this uh, experiment. So let's call that talk tau z and write an expression for it. Now the only forces that would tend to cause rotation about the z-axis would be the x components um, of the centrifugal forces c1 and c2. Now c1, the x component of c1 is acting at a perpendicular distance from the z-axis of L1, so we've got L1 times C1x, and the x component of C2 is tending to cause rotation in the opposite sense, so we give that a minus sign, and it's going to be minus L2 times the x component of C2. Now we don't yet know what this is numerically, it could be zero, it could be non-zero, but let's suppose for now um, that it's zero. In other words, you do the experiment and you observe that there's no rotation about the z-axis, 
and you can therefore conclude that there is no torque about the z-axis. And so let's consider what that would imply. Well, if tau z was zero, um, then from the equation that we've just derived for tau z, uh, the length ratio L1 over L2 would have to be equal to C2x divided by C1x, um, if that expression is supposed to be zero. Here is where that expression we, we wrote down uh, earlier on for the size of the centrifugal force is going to become relevant because the r omega squared cos theta is the same um, for both of the masses, but the inertial masses um, may be different. And so if we take the ratio of centrifugal forces or any component of the centrifugal forces, that ratio is going to be the same as the inertial mass ratio, right? The r omega squared cos theta bit will just cancel out when we do the division. And so we can write that as m i inertial mass of object two divided by m i inertial mass of object one. But we already have uh, another expression for L one over L two that must be true always, um, assuming that we've uh, you know set the system up so that it balances about the x axis. So we can set that equal to this in the special case where we observe that there is zero um, torque about the z-axis. And all of that reasoning works backwards, right? We've said that if tau z is zero, then this equation must be true. But you could follow all of those steps in reverse and say that if this equation is true, um, then tau z must be zero. So I can turn this into an if and only if symbol to say that the, the logic works both ways. So to summarize, so far we have said that the talk about the z-axis is zero if and only if this complicated looking um, condition is satisfied. So the next step is going to be see if we can do any simplifications with that expression and therefore try and get some insight into what it actually means because it's not obvious what the meaning of that is in the current form. So I'm going to multiply both sides by the denominator of the left hand side and I'm going to divide by the numerator of the right hand side. Now if I do that term by term uh, hopefully you'll agree that you're going to end up with the following equation mg1 over mi1 times g minus c1z divided by mi1 is equal to the identical quantity but with twos instead of ones right so mg2 divided by mi2 times g and then minus c 2z uh, divided by m i2, like that. We can then group some of the terms that look similar together, put them on the same side. Um, by that, I mean you've got two terms which are proportional to both the mass ratio, gravitational to inertial, um, and to the gravitational field strength, g. So we could factor out a g, put them on the same side, and get um, m g1 over m i1 minus m g2 over m i2 times field strength g and that would have to be equal to c1z over m i1 just by moving the terms around to the other side right and then minus c2z over um, m i2 now we can refer back to our expression for the centrifugal force and as we were saying earlier, the implication of that is that each component of each centrifugal force is proportional to the corresponding inertial mass. So if we take uh, the z component of, an, of the centrifugal force on object one and divide it by the inertial mass of object one, and then we do the same ratio for object two, we're going to get the same thing, right? Because C is proportional to mi. And so if we subtract them, we are going to get identically zero. So here is the key idea of the experiment, really. Right, the conclusion is that tau z, talk about the z-axis, is um, skipping ahead there, uh, so equal to zero if and only if um, this entire bracketed term is zero, right? Because gravitational field strength is not zero, and that implies that m g one over m i one is equal to m g two over m i2. In other words, the gravitational to inertial mass ratio is the same for objects one and two. Now this is interesting because if you do the experiment and you find that there is no rotation about the z-axis, then you can conclude 
that for uh, if you do this for a range of different materials, right, you can conclude that the gravitational mass is directly proportional to the inertial mass. Now, this is in fact what was discovered in this experiment. There was no talk observed about the z-axis. The experiment was done accurately um, by attaching a mirror to the rigid rod um, and shining a beam of light at the mirror and no deflection of the beam of light was observed. And the conclusion was of course then that gravitational and inertial mass are proportional to each other um, universally, right, for, for different materials. Um, but this was done to a much sort of higher precision than Newton's earlier experiments involving pendulums. So that was the key result and interpretation of this uh, Erdbosch experiment. There have of course been other experiments since 1900 um, that have basically confirmed the same result to higher and higher precision. So thank you for watching and see you soon.